Hello everyone, Pinera and Apple here with the next instalment in Big Finish's 60th anniversary celebration with the Once and Future, Episode 3, A Genius for War, starring Sylvester McCoy as the seventh-ish Doctor and written by Jonathan Morris. This story is pretty much the only story outside of the beginning and final stories of the line to relate to the Time War. Last episode ending with the Doctor being scooped up by the Time Lords, and it leans heavily into its setting with multiple Time Lord characters from that era, and the Time War box sets, and of course, plenty of Daleks along with their creator. All the characters being pretty contemporary with each other really gives this story a unique feel, as the other stories all have characters from across the timeline. For example, without spoiling the next stories, Episode 1 had Four and the members of the current unit team, and Episode 2 had the curator Five and Jenny. That do have connections, but aren't as close as the characters here. So without further ado, let's get into A Genius for War. The story starts with the Doctor stabilising as Seven after some jumping around as the first three incarnations, met with Vecklin, played by Beth Chalmers, a character who is pretty common in the Time War and the Time War adjacent story, but is the only things I could remember her from a Doom Coalition 3 and 4, which I've heard a long time ago, this is my first recent introduction to the character, and I actually really like her. Sure, she starts off seeming like the same slightly slimy Time Lord soldier, but really goes the extra mile to do the right thing, helping the Doctor, but also sticking to her morals. Strange, because whenever I enunciate her name, it makes me feel like she should be some sort of slimy Elystra type character. Vecklin. With Vecklin, Seven is also introduced to the General, played again by Ken Bones, who is the other side of the Time Lords that I thought Vecklin would be. Sure, he isn't evil or anything like that, but he is a general. He will do what he thinks is right to get his people to victory, which is of course a stance that'll get him in trouble with the Doctor sooner or later. But it's nice to see the character crop up again after Time Lord Audios and his appearance in the Moffat era. They are on the space station Zenobia, converted for war since its use as the Sixth Doctor's trial ground. And even though Seven is eager to leave, he ends up joining the Time Lords on their quest once he hears it. Save Davros. Who is offering to defect, as after a lifetime of civil war, the Daleks have had him imprisoned on Skaro's artificial moon for treason. So I guess he decided if they're going to lock him up for treason, he might as well do it. And the only Time Lord he trusts enough to rescue him is, guess who? The Doctor. Seven is completely suspicious, but decides to do it anyway. Vecklin is signing herself along in case he gets hit with some degenerative angst. Davros gets some good stuff in this story, played again by Terry Malloy, with a lot referencing another story featuring the general, but we'll get there. Sometimes Davros feels by the numbers, but here, even if there wasn't a lot of standout moments, there are some good ones and the rest of the performance is certainly not flat. Terry seemed to be putting the effort in he usually does getting across the mania, genius, and duplicitous nature well. The moon, Falcus, has a pretty cool design, a big Dalek bump with its own Dalek bumps. My lovely lady. Bumps. And it's an all-around pretty interesting idea. The trippy, almost prisoner-like design of Davros' cell is also a pretty clever idea. And sure, I think the time war angle overshadows them a bit, but these ideas still come through well-developed and interesting. Seven and Vecklin make it to Falcus, but find no Daleks, only Khaleds, seemingly suffering under the threat of the Thals dropping bombs. In an endless loop, as the interior is bombed and fixed forever, the main Khaleds we hear being Alden and Bosco, played by Yasmin Moana and Esmond Cole. They don't do a whole lot, but for being as one-dimensional as they are, the actors don't phone in the performance, even when the characters go all evil or uncaring. After some really nice references to Genesis, Our battle cry will be total extermination of the Thals! Our battle cry will be total extermination! Yes, yes. I've heard it all before. The Khaleds take the Time Lords to their leader, Davros. Davros and Seven are as happy to see each other as usual, facing off quite well. Davros confusing Vecklin for Seven's latest Earth Girl, and he exposits about his stay on Falcus. The Daleks creating the Thousand Year War scenario to keep Davros occupied, as the current Dalek Emperor doesn't trust him not to turn the Daleks to his own faction again, with a nice reference to the curse of Davros. 
Davros seems to have a real offer for the Time Lords, so Seven agrees to help. Davros is able to get them out by manipulating his own personality in the security system, but they're detected. The Khaled clones, becoming what I can only assume based off audio cues, are Dalek puppets from Asylum of the Daleks. A pretty cool concept to bring back that I wasn't really expecting because, well, really, who was expecting anyone to bring back anything from Asylum of the Daleks? Which never made any sense to me. Their escape is a little average, but Davros's plan is clever, getting them back to the space station, Davros immediately taking verbal control of the room to collaborate in private with the General, Seven smelling something off, so he stays instead of returning to his adventure, ready for when Davros makes his move. The conversation between the General and Davros is very interesting, establishing that thanks to Genesis and the Daleks' attempts to replicate that on the Time Lords, neither race can erase the other. So they're left in an endless war, where anything can be undone or rewritten, leading both the Matrix and Davros to conclude there are only two options. Mutually assured destruction, or a third party ascending above both the Time Lords and the Daleks. And Davros believes he can make this race, a hybrid of Daleks and Time Lords, something that gets the general thinking about the hybrid from Series 9. A question with many answers. It's very interesting to have it brought up here, but it does confuse me as to what it means for Series 9, as in that series, Davros should have no interest in the hybrid, since his plan fails here, and the General should have forgotten about it by then, or at least assumed that the Matrix prediction was averted. This story kind of works on its own perfectly, but, but it does kind of confuse Hellbent and the surrounding episodes a little. Sure, I guess I can kind of excuse the General being worried about it in Hellbent, but it still doesn't explain why Davros does what he does in the Series 9 opener. The General is hesitating, but really thinking about accepting. Seven pointing out that the Daleks would never take the deal due to their whole racial purity thing. But the General goes along with it anyway, even with Seven taking a firm stance against him. McCoy is really putting his best into this episode. Just listen to his venom. You will leave me with no choice but to stop you. And you will leave me with no choice but to designate you an enemy of the Time Lords and have you dematerialized. I believe you would do it too. I don't make empty threats, Doctor. Nor do I, General. If you don't like me as an ally, you really won't like me as an enemy. Vecklin is still in between the General and Seven, even as Davros starts his experiments. But a Dalek force appears to recapture Davros, easily making their way on board and capturing all of our main characters and some security forces. The General being captured on the front lines, which is a nice point of morals for the character, with all the morally dubious choices he's made. Vecklin attempts to get Seven out of there, but ultimately fails, led onto the Dalek ship along with Davros and the TARDIS. The Emperor isn't there, but the fleet is led by the Supreme Dalek, as they destroy the base after moving one light rail away, which I think is really funny as a play on light year, but with the Dalek's measurement of time, a rail, which I don't think has ever been definitively quantified. The Supreme is bitchy to Davros, but the Mad Creator is unable to convince him, the Daleks dropping them all off on Falcus. But of course, Davros has a backup plan, as he activates the clones to his own side, fighting the Daleks, and with a funny line from Vecklin, seemingly using Shabogan as a slur, the General runs off, leaving Vecklin and Seven with the Mad Creator. Davros attempts to go through with the experiment, using the Doctor as the Time Lord template, and himself as the Dalek template. Sounds like an idea for a very strange sitcom, Seven and Davros with a baby. Meanwhile, the General steals the TARDIS, but is unable to escape the Moon's transduction barriers. Davros is almost successful, but the degeneration comes in clutch, destroying the embryo before it can really be born. As they run, they come across the mainframe of the Moon, finding the centre of it, a massive Dalek mutant that once the Doctor accidentally drops his factor into the centre of it, it starts exploding. Davros flees the Daleks, assuming that his attempts to mix the two races' DNA failed due to the Time Lord's DNA being too unstable, shooting off in an escape pod, while Seven and Vecklin climb into now empty Dalek casings, safe floating in space as the remaining Daleks flee from the destruction. Seven and Vecklin survive, ending up inside the TARDIS thanks to the General, who 
complains very much about the TARDIS's lack of servicing. And we get a pretty funny epilogue for Davros, who's fallen to Skaro into the Lake of Mutations, stuck there whining as the monsters of the lake advance on him. The General and Vecla know nothing about the wider story, but now that this mess is cleaned up, they successfully drop Seven back where he was with nice funny dialogue. Are you going to thank him, General? After his incompetence led to the destruction of Space Station Zenobia? No. His incompetence, General? His incompetence, Commander. So that was a genius for war. And it was probably my least favourite so far. Don't get me wrong, it's not bad, but it does feel like a generic Time War story. Not in line with the rest of the series, no wacky character dartboard shenanigans, and its seemingly only focus to references is the hybrid storyline, which is an interesting route to take, but as I said before, I'm not sure it was done in the best way to become a perfect prequel to the Series 9 arc. The story has creative points, I'm just not sure if they end up cohesive. The characters are all great, Seven and Davros may not get big speeches against each other, but are both clearly acted with all effort, and both Vecklin and the General with their similar positions, but different perspectives, are very interesting to see. And makes sense, the General able to do good and bad, all in the name of attempting to stop or win the war. So, I'll give this story, A Genius for War, by Jonathan Morris, just below the last two at a 6.5 out of 10. I'd love to give it more, but it definitely did not appeal to me as much as the last two. So below it goes, and I can't wait for the next episode. Thank you everybody for watching my review of A Genius for War. Please like the video if you liked it, comment down below if you wish, or recommend something you want me to check out, and consider subscribing to the channel, and if you do, ring that notification bell so you're told every single time that I make an upload. Once again, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next review. Bye! Toast. A little piece of toast. Because there's so much to choose from. There's brown bread, white bread, all sorts of wholemeal bread. It comes in friendly packages, but right in on the side.